Hey everybody, welcome to the Film Threat Livecast. Uh, I'm Alan Ng, film editor-in-chief of Film Threat. Uh, we are, once again, Gorlis. Uh, he's off in the background, I'm pretty sure he's watching. Uh, I've got my phone ready to go in case uh, he texts me. Uh, but we got a great for show for you today. We got three big films uh, that have come out this weekend. Uh, we got uh, Rebel Moon, uh, More of the Same, Part 2. Uh, we got the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, and we've got Abigail. Uh, I'm joined today by Dante James, uh, Verbal Riot, and uh, hey, look, uh, join us in the chat. We want to make this as interactive and engaging as possible. If you've seen these movies, uh, yeah, just hop on that chat. So with that, let's get this show started. <laughs> Right. Hey, Dante, how you doing? Hey, what's going on, man? It is early, dude. <laughs> it is I don't know. Early, I've been doing man. this for almost two years, or for over two years now. It's, it's like, I literally, crazy. I had to like stick myself like with a, an adrenaline shot just to get out of bed this morning. So, um, but I'm happy to be here. Very happy to be here. Yeah, it sounds like you were at the late screenings of, of the movies we're talking about. I was at the, yeah, and I got home like at one in the morning. I'm not, I'm just not used to it, man. You know, the old body doesn't work the way it used to. So uh, getting up at uh, 7 a.m. this morning was a little brutal, but uh, you know what? It's Friday and uh, I'm happy to be here. All right. Well, let's see. We got to, let's just go to the chat and then we'll get into the, we'll get into the show. Um, from Warren Price Ray, uh, became a new member along with, Martin Swerve. So thanks for uh, thanks for joining up. Uh, we've got uh, great things for members. Uh, if you go to the member chat, there are special videos for you there. Uh, if you've seen Arcadian or Sasquatch Sunset, we got uh, Q and A's from the uh, from those movies from South by Southwest. Uh, also, you could join the Discord and get on, on the conversation. Uh, I was there quite a bit over the last few days, so uh, join us there. Uh, maybe Chris will. Chris will show up. Uh, he, uh, I think he types better than he talks, but uh, we'll see. Um, so yeah, let's uh, see. Okay, here we go. And it, hey, it's me in HD. Boy, what a Friday, Dante. Net Netflix version of Gore. Yes, you are. Uh, <laughs> DEI, you are black. I'm Gore DEI today. Gore. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had brown gore on Wednesday, and now you're management made a, made a made a change. <laughs> All right. So, hey, um, hey, let's uh, let me do this. Let, let's get into just a quick news article and then we'll get into the movies. Uh, I just need to pull it, pull it up here. Um, yeah, let's do this one. But um, sorry, give me one moment here. We'll get it. And um, OK, let me share screen. As I'm like building into this. Uh, is that it? Yep. Here we go. There's Kirsten Dunst. But uh, news item from Variety. Uh, Amazon Fallout to film second season in California with $25 million tax credit. Uh, why am I not scrolling? Uh, here we go. Scroll. Scroll. All right. Fallout, the post-apocalyptic series debuting on... Uh, this week on Amazon Prime is expected to relocate to California for its second season thanks to a $25 million uh, California tax credit. Uh, the California Film Commission announced Monday that it has awarded $150 million in tax incentives to a dozen shows, including Ryan Murphy, uh, two shows from Ryan Murphy, Dr. Odyssey, and Grotesquerie, um, NCIS Origins, because of course we needed another NCIS show because it makes right there's only 10 right now we need more i know but people watch them that's the crazy thing <laughs> uh fallout has the largest budget of any of the shows at 150 million in qualified expenditures for the season the first season was produced mostly in new york and with some filming in utah now the reason i bring this uh article up is uh if i scroll down here um let me see. Yeah, so studios apply for California credits during multiple funding rounds each year, and credits are awarded based on the potential job creation. Fallout comes from Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, the creators of Westworld, is based on the popular video game franchise. Even when a show has been allocated tax credits to move to California, that doesn't necessarily that does not guarantee that it will actually do so. 
Uh, a year ago, Amazon was awarded $25 million to relocate the second season of Citadel to California. However, uh, however, the, the show was later withdrawn from programming, and the money has been put back into the general pool. Uh, yeah, and uh, oh, yeah, and it's reported that the show will be filming in the second season uh, in September in Toronto. So I, I just find it interesting, A, that, uh, that California is desperate, and B... Um, you know, even though it's been awarded this money, uh, I don't think they've officially announced yet that they are moving to California. And that uh, it basically says, I think I read it before, is expected to relocate to California. Um, I mean, Dante, what do you think? First of all, I, I think, okay, I think, number one, that that number's too low for, for mm -hmm. a tax credit um, for the film industry anyway. My, my problem is they should have been doing this a long time ago, man. Like Hollywood, California, this is our product here. This is our product. Why have there not been more incentives given for studios to shoot here where our main product is film? Right? Yeah. Like they should have been doing this a long time ago. And they're doing it now because they're desperate. But you know, what about all the all the studios that have left? All the filming that's done in other places while those states or those countries reap the benefits, right? Yeah. I mean, we've been talking a lot about it, but but Hollywood is dying. Um, you know, I, I think that oh, it's, it's, it's dying a fast death, not not a slow one. Yeah, yeah, and especially, I mean, you, you had the pandemic, which killed killed much of the industry. Then you had these strikes that killed the industry. These these strikes uh, shut production down, uh, canceled contracts, uh, reduced the number of projects being uh, put in development, and they are going elsewhere. Uh, the pandemic, the strikes. Showed that you know it's best to go overseas, uh, best yeah. to go to Canada, best to go to England, uh, you know. And you know, I think Fallout. The only thing going for Fallout is that at least California has locations that match the location of Fallout. Um, you know, it, it, I you know I think we talked before that. Oh, I talked to a friend of mine who who basically says uh, Hollywood, the only industry running entertainment industry running in Hollywood right now uh, are agents and lawyers. Uh, yeah, you know, pretty much. You, you go to Hollywood, you know, there's there's nothing going on there. Uh, businesses are shutting down. Um, I was amazed to find at least one restaurant that was busy, but it was surrounded by a lot of businesses, restaurants that are closed. Uh, it, yeah, it just saddens me uh, that you know this is this is the land of movies. This is where movies were born. When and, I, uh, and I think I, yeah. I think a lot of people don't understand how vital the film industry is to California, especially to L.A., right? Because it's like you said, it's not just the movies themselves, but it's what they affect. They affect the, the restaurants around them. They affect the bars around them. They affect, you know, because people go to these places to eat, drink, and while work in the industry. But if these people are working in other places because California refused to give these studios some kind of break, then, yeah, we're going to lose a lot more than just movies. Yeah. Yeah. Can I blame our governor? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I blame him every day. <laughs> I know. Uh, Screw that guy. I mean, it, it's like he was he was he was at the uh, press conference for Disneyland uh, as they're about to expand. And I'm like, he's not he doesn't care about Disneyland. He cares about getting votes and, and being seen. And, yeah. and uh, you know, that's where he's at now. OK, one more story. I, I thought this was interesting. And then we'll get to the movies. Uh, this is from Hollywood Reporter. Uh, get this. Okay, so I, we, look, it wouldn't be a week if we didn't troll Disney. And here's uh, this week's <laughs> Disney trolling. Um, Disney publicist Marshall Weinbaum departs for Netflix award team. Uh, this is an exclusive. Uh, Weinbaum, who was voted publicist of the year by the ICG Publicist Guild in 2022, Spent 17 years at the Mouse House and will now work on awards campaigns for animated films under Julie Tustin. Why am I bringing this up? Uh, again, let's um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, an Marshall Weinbaum, an admired publicist who has been principal intermediary between the Walt Disney Studios and press for the past 17 years, uh, including on virtually every Disney animation and Pixar project is leaving the mouse house to join Netflix award team. Um, here we go. He will be manager of awards, awards uh, animation 
under veteran Julie Tustin on awards campaigns for the streamer's animated films, which has increasingly factored into the Oscar race. Indeed, over the past five years, Netflix has landed seven Best Animated Feature Oscar nominations, uh, at least one every year, winning uh, for Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio and two of the Best Animated Shorts, uh, you know, If Anything Happens and I Love You. Um, let's see. Uh, I want to get to the big part here. Uh, oh, yeah. So last paragraph here. I've loved my time at Disney over the past 17 years, Weinbaum tells uh, The Hollywood Reporter, and I'm really excited about this new opportunity at Netflix. I've always loved animation and awards, so this is where a dream come true. <laughs> I, I bring this up because that, that thing. That he loves part, animation, so he's leaving animation. Disney. <laughs> he left Disney <laughs> to Netflix. Because he loves animation. Wow. Wow, man. <laughs> How far the mouse has fallen. Oh, I mean, this is this is the most ironic thing you can say. Look, um, uh, it surprises me. This past year, Wish, uh, you know, all the Walt Disney animation uh, film, animated films that were musicals at least had one song nominated as Best Picture. Uh, Wish uh, it was the first film in a very long time where Disney didn't at least get an Oscar nomination for a song. Wow. Um, that's how bad it is. And for him to leave Disney, you know, who started uh, it's uh, who started doing animation shorts a hundred years ago, uh, started with Snow White, has this long tradition of animation. And for him to say, I always loved animation. This, this is a dream come true. Dude, that dream says a true. lot, man. Like that is, that's the final nail, dude. Like, it was funny. Is I, I'm fi I haven't seen the movie, but it mm -hmm. seems like Wish is the movie that has broken so many like Disney files, right? <laughs> like, yeah. like it seems like that one movie is it was mm -hmm. it for everybody. Like I'm done yeah. with Disney animation. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Is it that bad? It is. It is that bad. When you watch Wish, it, here, here's what I would say for those of you curious and has have Disney Plus. I would wait a month from now. So that the the number totals for Wish is not necessarily impacted, and then go watch Wish because your uh you know your your view there is not going to count for much, um <laughs> but but it is fundamentally the worst animated feature uh, I've seen uh, in a long time. It's a, the worst from Walt Disney Company, uh, definitely, wow. and and if you watch the D files, the the story is this: uh, they got rid of everyone who had ever who who had some connection with Walt Disney. That legacy, that legacy they built from the Disney Renaissance, starting with Little Mermaid. Everyone there who knew, who touched, who understood Disney animation, they're gone. And so Wish comes along. It's the 100th anniversary. They go through all this trouble of saying, hey, let's study Walt's movies of the past and let's replicate that in Wish. Uh, and what, what you realize is that the people who could actually tell them what Walt's legacy was, was gone. And that they had to go back and deconstruct everything and then put together Wish. And there was no one there who told them what to do. In fact, uh, in the D files, we talk about that, that there were those there who knew. And whenever they brought up suggestions or brought up criticisms, um, they uh, they got immediately shut down. And uh, sorry, we got to run that one there. And uh, so there you go. This is our, our weekly troll of the Walt Disney Company. Well, I mean, and the thing is, is once... Once you break, you, you, you've you killed all those connections. Mm -hmm. Is it even Disney anymore? Yep. Right? Yeah. Like, like it, you could say the same thing about, the, you know, a lot of you guys know that I'm, I'm a big gamer. You know, the company Bioware, right? When EA gutted that whole team, that the original team that gave us the original Mass Effect, that gave us Knights of the Old Republic, once you gut that whole team, is it even the same company anymore? No, because they, they produced nothing but garbage ever since they cut that team out. So... Same thing with Disney, man. If you're getting rid of everybody related that was related to Walt Disney in some way or another, it's not the same company. It's a different company. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Uh, I mean, th this happens a lot. I, I look. I, I'd been a diehard Dodger fan for forever, and uh, it was when the O'Malley's sold the team that it was like, okay, I'm done with the Dodgers because it's no longer a family team. It's a it's a corporate team, and you you look at baseball now. It's it's corporate. Oh yeah, um, all of it. And then when Bungie uh, was no longer working on on Halo, it was like, okay, I, I'm done with Halo now. Right. 
and, and, and it baffles me because the thing that made you a success is the thing you decide to cut, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Same thing yeah. with Disney. The thing that made them was animation. Mm-hmm. It made them. Like, Disney would be nothing without animation. And, and, yeah. and this is the thing that they choose to neglect and cut. Yeah. And this is a great segue for uh, Monday's verses. Uh, we have uh, the, the topic of verses on Monday will be uh, the erasure of Walt Disney. Where's Walt Disney and the Walt Disney Company today? And I'm going to have the gang from uh, from that park place, uh, Vash Sky, Jonas J. Campbell, uh, WDW Pro and Valiant, and Paul Chato is going to join us as well. So uh, Monday's going to be a great conversation about where's Walt Disney? What happened to Walt? All right. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, that's, let's see, let's pivot out of news. And uh, <laughs> Chris keeps saying, play clips. So here we go. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Here we go. We are going to transition and therefore... This is film threat. All right, let's um, let's get to our first film. We're gonna start small and then move our way up. Um, sorry, I gotta move in here. There we go. Let's talk about uh, Abigail. We'll get us bigger. We have a banner for it. Look at this. It's beautiful. Uh, I've shrunk us down so that banner shows up. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about Abigail. Um, so the story is uh, a group of, let me, uh, it's like I have so much stuff to transition as I'm doing this. Uh, I'll get to it. We are there. We have a group of, uh, I guess, kind of thieves and kidnappers who've been hired to kidnap the daughter of a very rich man. Uh, that girl is named Abigail. Um the uh, the conditions, so they, they go in, they kidnap this girl, they bring her to this mansion, and uh, they have to, these five uh, kidnappers have to watch over the girl uh, for 24 hours, and when they do, they'll get $7 million each. Uh, they're told, don't give your name, uh, and don't give any backstory, and so they decide to give themselves uh, the names of the Rat Pack, or at least uh, the Gene Car- Carlo Esposito character does that. And... Um, and so it sounds simple. Uh, they just got to watch over a girl for 24 hours. And uh, this is, of course, spoiled in the trailer, but the girl is a vampire and all uh, insanity ensues. Uh, Dante, what did you think of Abigail? First off, uh, I did like the cast. Um, I, you know, this was Angus Cloud's last movie, you know, RIP. R- R- um, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, Angus Cloud was in Euphoria. Uh, one of the most popular characters, Fez, and uh, he, you know, o- OD this year. So um, this was his last film, which is kind of sad, actually. <laughs> yeah, um, and it stars uh, Melissa Barrera. Also Melissa Barrera, her- who I who I'm in love with right now. I think she is <laughs> she is amazing, man. I I I, I there's I'm going to talk more about her later, but Melissa Barrera was phenomenal for me in this movie. Um, you had Dan Stevens, who's just always a great actor. He was in the show Legion. Um, it was a, it was a great cast. This and the story, okay, tongue in cheek, sure, mm-hmm. it had that. It just it lacks something for me that I just can't put my finger on because I feel like they they kind of promoted that promoted this as a horror film, and it really wasn't. It was more of a comedy to me. Like it, it just it, tonally, it was all over the place. Uh, I think the the, the actress, uh, I think Alicia Alicia Weir is that the young yeah, actress. Alicia Weir, yeah. I thought she was brilliant. She she has a future. That, that girl can act her. Mm. See, I'm watching my words. I'm watching my profanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we got we got ten more minutes, and then we can swear. I am literally my <laughs> ongoing battle with vulgarity. I I am fighting it. Um, I'm not going to curse. I am not going to curse. She can act, but that yeah, she has a future. Uh, I thought the cast was great. I just thought the story was everything was everything was great in the first thirty minutes. I'll, I'll put it to you that way. All right, and after that, it falls apart. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think it's weird. I, I think we have the same feeling about the movie, but I think we see it a little bit differently. Um, you know, I, I to me, this felt like a uh, basically a vampire escape room. You know, the, the whole idea yeah. is that yeah. you have the cast of characters locked into an, a mansion. 
uh, and they have to figure out how how not only to get out but how to survive as well. Um, and they play a lot with all the vampire rules uh, that are going on here. And um, you know, and you know, I, I think ultimately I had a good time with the movie, but at the same time, it was like I, I'll say there's more good than bad. And I think the good kind of beat it out to where I would uh, I would go ahead and recommend the movie. Um, I think you're probably the better connoisseur of horror films than I am. Yeah. But, uh, but here's the thing. I, you know, I, even from the trailer, I knew it wasn't going to be a straight-up horror film. I knew it was going to be a little more tongue-in-cheek than that. But And here's the thing. I didn't hate the movie. Um, I just – I felt like it just – it, it – it, it wandered in ways that that kind of left me like, okay, let's speed this up, please. Because, mm -hmm. like, I'm sorry, but all the scenes with the with the, the vampire girl dancing, it's yeah. like, guys, we we didn't need 20 scenes of her doing ballet. Yeah. It's like we get it, we get it. She's a vampire ballerina, right? Yeah. Like, we don't have to keep seeing her dance. <laughs> you only need to do it three times. They they did it at the beginning. Uh, they did it uh, in the middle just to kind of remind you that she she's a ballerina. And then there's a pivotal moment where where the dancing becomes important. Uh, but then they, I think they did it two more times beyond that. Yeah. Um, and and it was just like, OK. But but it, the one thing I did appreciate was, uh, at least for me, and, and again, I'm not a connoisseur of horror films, but I was definitely kept on the edge of my seat throughout the whole thing, trying to figure out what was going to happen next. Uh, I sort of figured out the overarching theme of it, like why they're there. I kind of got that early on. Um, but in terms of where are we going next and how are we going to take this vampire down? Um, uh, you know, I felt like, uh, and maybe it's my inexperience, but I felt like I was constantly guessing. I don't know. Was it, was it predictable for you? In a way of, I knew who was going to survive and who wasn't, yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I know. I mean, but really, it was kind of like, OK, we we see where this is going. And I will say I'm a little shocked how we got there towards the end, which is good, which mm -hmm. is good. I was I was a little like, OK, I didn't, you know, predict that part. But overall, I just felt like it, it, the deaths were very comical, <laughs> like <laughs> like so over the top that it was like, OK, this isn't horror. This is like. <laughs> You know, this is uh, exploitation for the most part, but in a good way, right? Yeah. But but not horror at all. Mm -hmm. um, there, there weren't even, like, any real jump scares for me in this film, which is weird. Like, maybe one scene, but even then, it, it was, like, not a big jump scene mm -hmm. or, or jump scare, I mean. Um, so uh, to, the, to categorize this as horror, I, I can't. Um, horror comedy, sure. Mm -hmm. Horror comedy, I... I mean, I think they were light. Yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, some of the, like the the crew, the the crew of kidnappers. Um, you know, you had you had Angus's character. You also had um, who who, who am I thinking? Peter's character, uh, Kevin Durand. Kevin Durand, um, yeah. Yeah, it's like yeah, the they're kind of playing these up for laughs. Even even the Dan Stevens character was was uh, set up for for somewhat laughs, more the dark laughs. Um, but Melissa's character was very straightforward, very, very much a straight person. Uh, Catherine Newton, um, you know, I, you know, as much as I liked the character, I felt like that they didn't go far enough with her. I agree. Uh, she, just seemed, she just seems too much of a stereotypical Gen Z, uh, Gen Z kid. Um, and then, uh, and then you have Rickles in the middle, uh, our, our person of color. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of like I, I felt like it was fighting whether it wanted to be serious or whether it wanted to be funny. And I think tonally, that's where I kind of lost. I got kind of lost in the sauce of this. Uh, you know, I, I really wish they either went comedy or they went drama and not trying to do a, a blend of the two. Yeah. And I think the audience is going to have a problem with that, too, when they see it. I do. Here's the thing. I do think this movie's going to do well. Um mm -hmm. Just because there's nothing really out right now, so uh, and it's a horror film, so well, quote unquote horror. So yeah. people will go watch it, um, I, but I think a lot of people are going to leave kind of feeling the same way I did, where it's like, okay, that was a film, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, no, like, and it wasn't horrible and it wasn't great. It was just kind of like I'll forget about it in a couple of days. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's give me the bottom line here. Is it a recommend? Uh, and uh, what's your, what's your final feelings about Abigail? So look, man, I I would say just because based on the performances of the actors, it's a, it's a watch for me. 
like I tell people to go watch it. Um, like I said, Melissa Barrera is she's she's just blowing me away, man. Like I I feel like the more and more I see of her, uh, I want to see more of her in movies, right? And uh, it was directed by the guy who did a few of the Scream movies. So if you like Scream, you'll you'll probably like Abigail, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, I I think I would recommend it as well. I okay, so for someone who doesn't like horror films, uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, it got me through. Uh, I was able to get from beginning to end, have the good number of scares. Uh, I think, let, let me ask you this. Uh, it, it, to me, it felt a lot smarter than most horror films I watch, especially vampire films. Well, uh, that well, may just be me, but do, do you think it was a smart film? I feel like it knew what it wanted to be, mm -hmm. right? Even though the tone was all over the place, I, I think they knew what they were trying to do. And they, they wanted kind of like a fun horror film, right? Because that's that's what it, really what it is. And like like Scream, right? Scream is a fun horror film, right? Like it's an event. You go with your friends and, you know, you expect Ghostface to just appear out of nowhere and have super strength for no reason. But you go there for that reason because you know it's going to be goofy, it's going to be fun, and there will be a few jump scares, right? I, I think that's what this movie is. It knows what it wanted to be. Yeah. And I, I, there's also a puzzle to solve, which makes it somewhat engaging, which is you know, that, that escape room aspect to it. Like, honestly, right. some, of the most, some of the more intriguing parts of the film was finding out the backstories of the thieves. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I, you know, that whole, that whole opening scene, uh, segment in the beginning of the movie where, yeah. uh, where Melissa Burr's character is basically doing cold readings on everybody. Yeah. You know, picking that out, was a I, cool scene. Yeah. I always enjoy that stuff. And it's a great way to introduce you to characters without having each of them explain their backstory. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which gets to be cliched at times. All right, so a definite recommend from you and me about Abigail. I, I would say a, a, a tepid recommendation. It's a Not soft watch. It's a soft recommend a recommendation. Like, you know, it, you won't completely waste your money, <laughs> yeah. but at the same time, don't expect, like, you know. Well, I think it could be a date film. I we. We talked to, uh, I forgot what director, we talked to a director recently of a horror film and uh, he revealed to us that horror films are, uh, women are the largest audience, the, the majority audience of horror films. And, uh, and this one definitely falls right into that. You have the, the female protagonist, uh, you have the cute little girl who's the vampire. Uh, this, this will fall right into that wheelhouse there. So definitely, all right. So I uh, definitely recommend. Let's get to your comments. Uh, My Kingdom for a Film says, looking forward to your review of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Felt like Richie's most subdued film yet, but the characters fell on point. Okay, we'll get to, to that uh, shortly. Uh, from Lord Thoth, uh, like, share, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, sign up as a member, and join the Discord and Rumble. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, be sure to hit that like button. Uh, and comment if you will. From Scott McKenzie, member for... for is that 18? No. Yeah, eight, 18 months. Uh, wow. Okay, you've been here for the long haul as well. Hail Dante Allen and chat. Positive vibes and prayers for Chris. Hail. Yes. Uh, from Andrew Cram, uh, gifted five film threat memberships. Get those memberships. Sign up on Discord. Uh, from Jim Watari, a member for eight months. Hail Allen and Dante. I hope Chris is uh, gets better real soon. I hope so too. Uh, my kingdom for a film. I I'm I'm not too sad that Hollywood is dying. Maybe that will cultivate a better culture and movie making and better movies in the future. It always uh, does. It yeah. always does, man. I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Not only is Hollywood dying, but the business of movies is is on the verge of collapse. And that gives you know you uh, gives indie creators, indie filmmakers, uh, the opportunity to step in and find something new. Uh, we talked about the long game with the director and how the fact that uh, in order to find distribution, he had to go out and get it on his own. And his movie is in theaters, uh, in Regal, in in AMC and Cinemark. There, the, there has the, never been a better time to get your movie seen than right now. Yeah, and the and the options are there. Uh, there are a lot of options for you to get people to see your movie, and it's uh, it's about being creative. It's about being innovative. And uh, and if you find your way in. Let us know. We can share it with others. Uh, from Patrick Lemire, I'm sick of Hollywood and NFL teams getting free money while I'm getting killed by my grocery money, by, by, by my grocery bills. Yeah, I mean, I've always had issues with states giving money 
to uh to movies to be there if anything i i would much prefer just give them you know tax-free incentives to do it here rather than uh taxpayer money yeah. but that's a whole other discussion that is another discussion <laughs> okay well Let's one we should have though absolutely i mean we're, we're constantly having that discussion of the dying business and what indie filmmakers can do to uh uh to to buck the hollywood system because i don't think I don't think you want to do a Hollywood film nowadays. Uh, I don't know who does except people who you know, want to make money. I mean, there's and, no incentive, man. Like, even with the money, it's like you're probably going to take a loss before you take a profit. Yeah. Yeah. And the only person really taking advantage of that Hollywood system is Zack Snyder. <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, Rock Samsonite. If a dream is a wish a heart makes, then a fart is a wish my butt makes. Hmm. Yes. That's yeah. fair. All right, from John N. Disney was kind of the best back in the day. Iger has destroyed it. They need to boot the entire upper management. Can't disagree with you there. Here we go. Now we're into an Abigail uh, conversation. Uh, Patrick Lemire, it's like a Home Alone with Vampire. Yes, I would say that. Yes, it's like Home Alone with Vampires. Uh, was Abigail the most badass vampire than Edward Cullen's? She was more entertaining. Mm hmm. Yeah, less moody. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. You know, I'll be honest. I, I think her performance, I was a little mixed on it. Uh, there were times you just felt like she was acting, but other times she really nailed it. I, th I think she came into her own definitely at the end of the movie. I, I think for someone her age, I thought she killed it, man. Like she, like I was, I bought into her. <laughs> you know, right. I, I, bought in that, I bought into that she was an old soul, you know? All right, from Mr. Someone, uh, is it similar to From Dust Till Dawn? Same, same tongue in cheek, I think. Yeah, and, and roughly the same idea, too. Um, Patrick Lemire, like Renfield or the Munsters? Uh, not the Munsters. Uh, Renfield? I don't know. Is this is more this or less really Renfield? Less? Oh, was that more or less Renfield? I think it was less Renfield. Uh, I think it was a little <laughs> more serious than Renfield, uh, definitely. Uh, Professor Fear, meh. Is the step up from awful? We are slowly making our way back to good. Yeah, I say it all the time. It's like it's it amazes me that we are gushing over okay films. And it's not look. It's not about men. Man. It's, it's it's the fact that you know there's just times where there's a you have this movie where there's things about it you really like, but then there's things you, you just can't look past, right? And I, I think for me that's where Abigail sits, where there's aspects of it I really like. You know, but then there's things where I'm just like, oh, this could have been cut by 15 minutes at least, right? 15, 20 yeah. minutes. This movie should have been shorter. Uh, it should have been in and out. It should have been 90 minutes, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah, it went for a solid two hours. Uh, from Chris Gore, soft instead of a fully erect recommendation. Got it. <laughs> uh, I'm, no, I'm half it, chub. I'm at half chub right now. I know. You know, do you remember the days when you really liked a movie and wanted to tell people about it? Uh, oh, those days are rare these days, man. I, I know. <laughs> I mean, last week it was Civil War, but we weren't talking about it for the right reasons. Right. Uh, you know, there there was a time where, you know, where a movie came out, uh, it touched you emotionally, it connected with you, it made you think about it. Uh, Lord of the Rings is probably the, the big one I remember from a long time. Infinity War and, and Endgame. You know, there are movies where you just had to go out and, and tell each other how amazing it was. Um, but now it's like, well, it, it's it, it wasn't Ahsoka. <laughs> it's better than it's better yeah. than uh, you know, it was better than Wish. The bar, the bar is tragically low. Yeah. <laughs> All right, from Brock Samsonite. Uh every time someone smacks the like button, Chris Gore gets another hit of morphine uh, while he's resting. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so yeah, hit that like button and uh, give pleasure to Chris. That didn't sound right. Uh, L. <laughs> Chupa, Chupa Is that right? Flaccid recommendation. I don't know. I I mean, I Melissa Barrera. Alan, uh, Alan might be more hard for this movie than I am. Let, let's put it to you that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you clearly like Melissa Barrera. So, I, uh, I did like her quite a bit. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> I, I I will say the, the her appearance at the end of the movie was to me the uh, a great capper to it. Even though 
you know, I didn't like the final, final part of this the, the movie. Uh, I did like the state of which the characters were at the end. <laughs> I'll go, that's the best way I could say without spoiling it. Um, Solomon Thornton, uh, I remember reading an article from the 50s saying that it is the end of Hollywood. Uh, repetitive films insulting the audience and TV being the king of entertainment. History repeats itself. You know, I think a lot of it has to do, I, I think you're right in terms of it, it comes in cycles. There, there's a point where uh, Hollywood rests rests too much on its laurels uh, and takes the audience for granted. Uh, and uh, and then we start sh stop showing up. And we're I don't think we're at that point yet where Hollywood is making decisions to get us back. Well, we've seen like even in the 90s, we saw how, you know, independent film just shot up, right? Like with Miramax and how people were looking for indie films instead of mainstream movies, right? Because Tarantino, Rodriguez, all these guys were just blazing a trail, man. And people were hopping on the indie train. I think we're going to see that same kind of thing happen right now. I think people are just done with the big studio film. And I think we, we are going to see more independent stuff and and more stuff on stream, right? So and, and and then honestly, it's a generational thing, man. Like young people just don't watch movies the way or consume movies the way we did. So Hollywood is in trouble. It, 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 you know, we're not we're not just spitting hyperbole here. Hollywood is in trouble. Absolutely. All right, let's transition. Let's talk about our next film. Hold on. There's. Uh, don't forget the. Yeah, I got the new members. Okay. The old old note. Uh, let's uh, let's pivot. Uh, you fuck that bitch. Oh my God. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's talk about the next film. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do this. We're going to, I'm sorry, here we go. We're going to Rebel Moon. We're going to talk a little bit about this and then get to Ministry of uh, Ungentlemanly Warfare. Sorry, I'm I'm doing everything. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for getting that banner up. Um, so, yeah, I woke up real early this morning and decided let's. I, I'm going to watch part two. Uh, I also, like you, Dante, I tortured myself and watched the first part again yesterday. Um, let's talk about Rebel Moon. Um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll just. I know we talked. I know everyone's talked about the first part a lot, and and I. I want to get your impressions because that's the one you saw yesterday, the first part. For the first time I watched it yesterday and uh oh man, I I wanted so badly to like Zack Snyder, man. Like I I I really tried. I I still stand by his Man of Steel movie. I still stand by uh the Watchmen or Watchmen and uh uh I just I I don't understand how he gets funding, man. Like Rebel Moon, it felt like just one big cutscene from a very mediocre RPG. Like that, that was the whole movie, right? I've seen better cutscenes in Skyrim than than this movie. And I'm sitting here watching it thinking, like, okay, he got funding for this. Someone gave him money to make this shite, and and they're giving him more money to make more of them. Like, like what am I missing? Are these movies, I mean, are these movies like making money? Are they are they being seen? Is this why they're giving him all this money? Because I, I don't get it. I don't understand how you can fail up so much as Zack Snyder has. Yeah, well, he's Zack Snyder. He he commands this kind of But what does that thing. even mean anymore? Like, what does it mean? He he doesn't pull in. What, what was his last big, uh, like, highest grossing film? Oh, gosh. I'm trying to think. Oh, well, I mean, it had to have been uh, the Snyder Cut. <laughs> Not the Snyder Cut, but but at least he started uh, Justice League. Um, but I mean, was Superman versus Batman was that was that a big film? Was I, I, I guess it was. I look, yeah. yeah, I think it was. I think I think that might have been the last time he, you know, he had a big grocer. But I just I don't I I don't get it, man. I don't I don't I don't get how he is still a thing right now yeah. in Hollywood. Well, l let me tell you about. Rebel Moon and my problem with Rebel Moon, uh, especially from part one, it th this movie feels derivative. Uh, I've seen this movie before. We talked about Seven Samurai. We talked about A Bug's Life for crying out loud. Uh, this is his version of that. And the problem 
with being derivative is you know the beats of the story before the movie even begins. And that's that's exactly what happens here. Uh, a, a town gets attacked. One of the heroes of the town goes out, finds uh, finds warriors to save them. Um, they go through. Uh, they 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 encounter the bad guy. They defeat the bad guy. They go back heroic winners. But in part two, you didn't really defeat the bad guy. And it's like uh, we've seen this before. And and not only that is you've taken a story we've seen before and now you're stretching it to two hours. And now that you've brought on part two, you've stretched it to four hours. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're constantly, I was constantly ahead of this movie, uh, just waiting for the next moment to happen. So I can get through this. Um, you know, I'm, you know, it's six in the morning, I'm watching this and I'm, I'm begging for this movie to move along. So I'm not, you know, so, I, so I just don't feel like I'm wasting two hours of my time. The thing is, so no one, no one I know who has seen this movie has said anything good to say about it, right? So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, did Zack Snyder sign like a two movie deal when he did this? Because um, there's no way they would have gave him a sequel based off the returns of the first movie. Yeah, I mean, it's weird that I have to question the, the, uh, the, 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 the budgeting behind this, or the, the or, or just the business aspect of this. Um, you know, Netflix is an interesting company, and uh, this is something I've been learning a lot about Netflix as I, as I talk to producers and directors who deal with Netflix, especially the ones who are creating uh, Netflix originals. Um, but Netflix relies heavily on the algorithm. You know, yeah. there, there's an algorithm out there that tells creators and, and executives this is what people are into, and I have to think that this is something the algorithm told them they are into. I'll give you a great example of what I'm saying. Um, if you watch my interview with Michael Mendelson on the Film Threat Interview channel, uh, he's, he makes a lot of movies. He makes a lot of indie, mid-budget movies. Uh, he, uh, he's been producing a lot of films for Netflix. And he'll make a movie, uh, he'll submit it, and then Netflix will come back and say, hey, you know, the algorithm says you should have this in your movie. Uh, or then he'll get a bunch of notes saying, you know, the algorithm is telling us that you should do this and you should do that. And then I asked him, uh, does it work? And he told me, yeah, it works. Uh, the last movie he produced for Netflix uh, was, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, but it it was on the top. It was the, the first movie uh, that was, it was the longest movie he made for Netflix that was in the top 10. Uh, so the algorithm seems to work, um, but and, and it seems to be the reason this movie is being made. Uh, for some reason, I think people want to see this, and I'm not sure what aspect about this that that people that Netflix thinks people want to see. I honestly, I I don't know about the al algorithm. I think I think there is a contingency of look. Zack Snyder has a fan base. He has a certain fan base, right? And I don't know if he still has that fan base, but I know that for a while he was pretty supported by a group of people, right? Mm -hmm. Which they called the Snyder bots, whatever, you know? Um, does he still have that? Like, does he still have that pull? Does he still have that draw that he had, like, uh, when they were, you know, released a Snyder cut? Well, like, 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 does he still have that uh, support? Or are, are, are they basing this on old hype? Is that mm -hmm. why he keeps getting funded? Because yeah. I can't imagine people are, you know, subscribing to Netflix to watch Rebel Moon. No, but people are sticking with Netflix to watch Rebel Moon. Uh, th I mean, that those are the two big things. Uh, I mean, Netflix right now is a popular and successful platform. Uh, and mostly, though, because of the content it has, the, the vast library of films it has. Um, and because because they have such a large i mean they just grew its, it's subscriber base over the last quarter so that means more money is coming in and, and more money is coming in to make this movies like this um i think they're getting smarter though I, I think they're if you look at their upcoming slate um the production costs are, are definitely going down uh they're also going to uh foreign foreign content pr providers uh, getting foreign series so th they're being at least smart about it and they're figuring out what is it that people want to watch, and, and they're putting it up there. Um, this would be well, and, 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 and honestly, Netflix does have good 
shows on on uh, mm-hmm. on right now. I think uh, you know, like the Gentleman uh, Guy Ritchie uh, show and um, Three Body Problem. Like they have shows mm-hmm. people want to watch, uh, and maybe Rebel Moon gets lost in the sauce, and, and maybe you know people will, will give it a chance purely because they're watching these other shows. <laughs> yeah. You know, they already have Netflix, so why not watch it, right? But that's not a for me. That's not enough of a reason to keep funding these movies. Yeah. So let, let's talk about Rebel Moon for a second. Uh, what was your impression? And what what made it boring for you? Everything. I mean, dude. Like, I'm sorry, but the lead character, she. I've seen her in other things, and she she's been a lot better in other things I've seen her in. I can't remember the name of the actress right now. Um, oh, Sophia Botello. Yes. Um, I think she's actually a decent actress, but I think this movie didn't didn't serve her at all. You have Charlie Hunnam in a film, mm-hmm. and again, he's good. But in a film like this, it, it, it just it just it feels so. It's like I said, man. I've seen better cutscenes in video games, yeah. And that's what this movie feels like. And the villain himself is so cartoonish. It's like there's no <laughs> depth. There's no depth to this guy, and I, I, I just. I find myself like, okay, and they do the whole trope of, okay, let's gather other warriors and fight this this evil together, right? And even the warriors they gathered made no sense, man. Like, what was up with the space Indian, dude? It was like, (laughs) like, what? (laughs) I know, because his thing was, you know, he can can command the uh, great beasts of the air. But but they didn't even take the great beasts of the air with them. Exactly. Exactly. The the other thing is this is typical the the thing that uh, I mean look this is the bu- this is a bug's life this is Zack Snyder's version of a bug's life and and what makes it Zack Snyder's version is it's dark it's depressing it's and has slow mo a lot of slow mo a lot of slow mo and and you and unlike a bug's life this runs for two hours a little over two hours um you know I you know there's only so much the human spirit can take in, in terms of <laughs> being depressed and and being dark. You've got to lighten it up, but it just gets bad. It, I mean, it gets worse and worse for our heroes. Uh, and then you get these bright moments where they they turn things around and they they kill the bad guy. Um, Look, not, not not that we're going to transition, but I there is a there is a it's 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 weird. There's a correlation between Zack Snyder and Guy Ritchie, right? Because both mm-hmm. of these guys are both style over substance. Yeah, like literally, they're both style over substance. Except one does it a lot better than the other. <laughs> One's a lot cooler. <laughs> One's a l- way, way more cooler than the other. Yeah. So uh, let's. I'll, I'll just quickly go over part two, but because you know, look, if I told you the plot of part two, you, I, I bet you could tell me what the ending is. Oh, but it's basically, God. you know, we know the protagonist, the uh, Ed Screen character, doesn't die, uh, and he, you know, he comes back, and and. Um, it opens with basically uh, the gang coming back to the planet, to the farmer saying, we've killed the Admiral. Uh, every time they kill the Admiral, they, they, they go away and they, they reset. Um, well, you know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, they're going to come back. And, and, and so word comes that they're going to be there in 10 days. Uh, Dante, do you think they're going to be back in 10 days? Probably. Or do you think they'll be early or late? <laughs> I, look, based on how the movie ended, obviously they're it's going to they're going to come right away. Yeah. So so it's like we have ten days to prepare for this coming invasion. Right. That's going to come uh, in three days. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I you know and and you know of course the what what happens now there's there's a training montage. Of course you do. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, I could I could keep describing it, uh, and you'll know exactly where this is going. The other thing is you have these warriors. There's, I believe, five of them, five or six of them. Um, there's a point. <laughs> this is they're having their last dinner together, and uh, and uh, was Jamin Hansu's character name? Uh, sorry, uh, oh, it's uh, Titus, General Titus. He gets them all there for dinner and says, uh, "We are going to fight together and maybe die together. So we need to tell our stories." <laughs> and so, so each one of the characters goes and tells their story uh and uh i'm like this is you know this is basically a struggle session and and the reason i bring this up is because you know we're supposed to feel sympathy for these characters why because they told us their story 
Um, to me, that's a cheat. You know, you you should feel sympathy for a character because you see what they go through. Right. You shouldn't feel sympathy for a character because they tell you what they went for. Um, and, you know, yes, there are there are uh, you know visuals to back up the story uh, and make things look bad. But again, um, <laughs> weirdly, in a four hour movie, including parts one and two, uh, they still didn't have enough time to tell each of these stories. And um, uh, it's and you know again because it's so derivative, you know exactly how it's going to end. Uh, um, you know, not only is there a fourth third act, there's a fifth and a sixth third act. Uh, that comes. And so uh, it, it's, you know, the reason that we're talking about it this morning is the reason I saw this. Otherwise, I, I would I would have given up on Rebel Moon probably when I did the first time. And that was halfway through when the first one came out. Now, didn't Zack Snyder say that there was supposed to be like four more movies? I'm sure in his head there are four more movies. <laughs> uh, they, they, look, spoiler alert, uh, you know, they're setting things up for four more movies. Oh, uh, Jesus. But I just, again, uh, the the human spirit can only take so much depression. And I, uh, I just find it fascinating that Netflix is willing to bank on Zack Snyder. Yeah. Well, I, I think this is a pivotal moment for Zack Snyder. Uh, you know, if uh, this, the show, this movie could potentially do well and it'll just continue Zack Snyder's career or, or it'll be a wake up call saying, you know, you've got to kind of reconsider what you're doing uh and, or or netflix is gonna say hey you know great job maybe maybe you could do the next one with less money do we do we have the numbers like the, the views on, on, on how many people have, have streamed this 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 movie yeah i don't i wish i did i wish i was more knowledgeable on that i, I know other channels do it and have have those numbers because I'm, I'm just curious man like there has yeah. to be a reason they keep funding this guy well i mean there was a commitment for part two that was made prior to part one right so kind of like the, the velma situation yeah uh, the question is, is part three, was part three in that, uh, that mix? Yeah. All right. So let's, uh, let's see. What, oh yeah. So bottom line, what's, what's your feeling about the Rebel Moon series? Like haven't seen the second one. Um, I'm sure it's fascinating, but uh, just based off the first one, please don't waste your time, guys. Time is valuable these days. There's <laughs> just, there's other things you could be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, there, there's is, better TV out there for you. Yeah, I, I mean, I hate to think that Zack Snyder's setting the standard for what what film and TV is going to be like in the future. I, I hope not. Um, you know, I get it. I think this is uh, the best thing I could say about <laughs> about Rebel Moon is uh, I could make Rebel Moon. G give me a hundred million dollars, I, yeah. I can make this exact same movie, and I could probably and, and, I could probably do it better. Yeah, I could hire people to do the special effects. I could hire great actors. The, the problem is, is the story. The story is so weak. The story is derivative. Uh, and that's why it becomes boring. And to to have gone in four hours uh, for this story that is predictable, uh, I, I don't understand it. I and the other part of it, too, though, is. man, like, if we're, if we're being honest, and, you know, somebody had to bring this up, and I guess it's going to be me, the whole girl boss of it all, you know, like, it's so girl. It's like, I'm sorry, I don't buy that this girl is beating down these soldiers, right? Like these big, beefy male soldiers. I just didn't buy it. I, I, I'm sorry. There, there's no way you could tell me that this little girl, you know, even with her great skill, mm -hmm. would have beaten all these guys. Yeah. But at the same time, at least she's surrounded by men. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, there's no Marvel situation. But but thing, but but she's better than all of those men. Yeah. Well, the other thing. So there well, you go. Yeah. Well, of course. Well, the reason is because we were told that she was, uh, she was trained as one of the elite. Uh, and again, uh, we were told that, and that's how that's how it comes to be. The other thing is, uh, there's the Asian character Nemesis. Um, what is it about not giving Asians lines? In, in TVs and movies, and, and of Why course she, had, always... of course she had to be the sword wielder, right? She yeah. had to be, she had to be the ninja, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, can't, you can't waste an Asian man. It's like when you got an Asian in your film, you got to make him a ninja. Yeah, but okay, here, here, here's a plus side. Here's a plus side. Um, at least the action makes sense uh, compared to uh, anything Star Wars and Marvel has done recently. Uh, when you see a fight scene, you you understand why people are doing the things they do, uh, and it looks pretty cool. 
so keep that in mind. Keep Rebel Moon in mind when you watch The Acolyte. <laughs> All right, there we go. Let's get to your comments. Uh, we're going to... Here we go. Uh, from Z. What made Rebel Moon Part 2 so hard to watch was the musical score. Uh, it was so awful for the first 45 minutes. That's all I could take. Yeah, again, this this just goes into this dark tone that Zack Snyder has to bring into every damn thing he does. Uh, you know, I, I will I will say at least did didn't he do the that the zombie the Evil Dead movie in Vegas? Is that uh, he, you know, did he do? That? Yes, I think he did. Okay. I, I can't remember the name of it. Um. Yeah, it's one of those. Uh, at least that one was bright. If he didn't do it, then it, it makes sense. <laughs> Why? Because at least that one had color and light to it. Yeah. Uh, a little bit more positivity than everything else Zack Snyder has had ever done. Uh, and the movie just matches. Uh, the music score just matches this depressing, dour tone. Um, I do also like the fact that... Uh, what was I, pu I put the note here. This is uh, if you had taken the movie Witness and turned all the Amish into kick-ass warriors. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, from Patrick Lemire, sometimes I feel like I end up going to see a movie to support my theater so the whole thing doesn't go away. I can't be in a world without theaters. Uh, yeah, the, Patrick, I'm right there with you. Uh, I They opened an IMAX theater down my down the street of my from my house. Uh, they put, an, like I said, put an IMAX in there. Uh, it ran a year and then the pandemic happened and um, wow. it was like so fearful of what was going to happen. They, they, in fact, Edwards announced that it was going to close that theater. And if it weren't for the city renegotiating the lease for the land, uh, we would have lost that theater. And so now I go to that theater. I saw both Abigail and the uh, ministry of gentlemanly warfare uh, at that theater yesterday, just because I need to support and keep this theater open. Yep. That's how I spend my money. Uh, from Brock, Brock Samsonite, great. It's time for Zack Snyder and the quest for more money. Absolutely. He's certainly getting a lot of money to do this stuff. SP of the North. Uh, I'm watching the I'm watching for the nine-hour, all slow-mo, black and white, darker and grittier Snyder cut. To come. <laughs> I got 20 minutes into the first and quit. Yeah. I like I, that. Again, there's only one reason I saw Rebel Moon, and it's so we can talk about it. Other than that, no. <laughs> Eric Hansen, member for 15 months. Thank you for your support uh, for all this time. I can't. I still can't believe I saw Rebel Moon figures at GameStop. Were, were they next to the to the Reva uh, action figures? <laughs> Probably. I, I will say uh, Netflix. Uh, they are into merchandise. Uh, Netflix, I guess, co-runs. Uh, they restored the Egyptian theater in Hollywood, and there's a large Netflix yeah. store right in the plaza there. I mean, it's large. It's a large building uh, to sell network Netflix stuff. Solomon Thornton, there's a video by a close. Uh, there's a video by the Closer Look that breaks down how Rebel Moon was executed poorly, and how it stole from Star Wars and forgot the real meaning of Lucas Star Wars: The Hero's Journey. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. You could even break that down. I, I believe from what I've been told that this is Snyder's uh, Star Wars story that he had pitched and was uh, rejected. But when you talk about the hero story, yeah, um, the Kara, uh, sorry, let me get Cora character. Um, you know, her her hero's journey is basically uh, to rise above the struggle. Uh, I, in terms of her character, uh, her as a person, she doesn't really change that much from start to finish. Uh, I don't know if you noticed anything like that. This, she's pretty much the same from start to finish. Uh, just well, I mean, again, I haven't seen the second film, but just based on the first movie, man, it's like watching paint dry. Mm -hmm. I, I found nothing. There was nothing captivating about this character at all. Yeah, and then you're you're throwing in five side stories that you have to tell quickly. Yeah, no, it felt like an RPG. Like you're going on these side missions, <laughs> and then you have like this 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 stupid boss battle at the end, right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, from Gun Ho Mac, Snyder gets paid to make one movie with four versions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I agree with that. Didn't he say something about that he had a better a better version of Sucker Punch? Yes, he wants to do he wants to redo Sucker Punch. Yeah. So we, we want to see two two more hours of Sucker Punch. Uh, this... <laughs> I, By the way, there there was already a rebooted version of it, right? I mean, not rebooted, um, a revised version of it already. I think like there's a director's cut mm -hmm. of of Sucker Punch. 
So he wants to make a director's director's cut? Like, I, I, I don't get what he wants to do. So I'll tell you, this is, this is what I think Zack Snyder's definition of a, a director's cut is. His movie comes out, people hate it, and so now he wants to recut it. And that's the director's cut. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly how I felt after hearing the news about Sucker Punch. By the way, I, I, I need everyone to understand how bad Sucker Punch was. You had four hot girls fighting <laughs> fighting dragons, fighting mecha samurais, mm -hmm. fighting Nazis, and it still failed. Well, yeah. Hot girls in skirts and swords failed. How is that even possible? Yeah, and, and then you have that ending. Which just oh Jesus, yeah, and, yeah. I mean, that would, someone someone thought that ending was cool because you see it in movies a lot, and and I don't know how you could have thought it was cool for this one. All right, from film uh, from <laughs> film threat from Rumble ADL is twenty four. Hey eighty, uh, Zack Snyder just needs a solid cinematographer and a decent writer, then give him a bunch of money and make four films <laughs> with that which is what Netflix likes. Then why even have Zack Snyder there in the first place? Yeah. You, I mean, <laughs> right. look, look, he has a vision. I, I will say this. He has, you know, you you know when you see a Zack Snyder movie. He, he is that good or bad, though? Is that good well, or bad? Well, from what I can tell, it, it seems like his best movies are his adaptations of other people's work. Watchmen 300. Um, Dawn, Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, Dawn of the Dead. Well, it was but, damn good. Yeah, but look, I mean, Rebel Moon, that's indicative of what I think Zack Snyder is. He he can't tell an original story. He has to take something and make a derivative of that, make a make his version of it. And he's taken the Seven Samurai and made his version. And it's not in, I just, other than the look of it, it doesn't elevate that story in any way. So you might uh, as well. Okay, but you know why? Down. Because so many other directors have done it better. Mm-hmm. Right, Seven Samurai has been stolen by so many people who did it better. Yeah, Pixar <laughs> did it better. Pixar did it better. Yeah. All right, for Jeremiah, uh, these films are for people who just want something in the background while they doom scroll. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what? Yeah, you're probably right. I mean, yep. that's, that's what. <laughs> I believe Netflix has said that they're no longer going to necessarily give subscriber numbers anymore, but that they're going to give uh, minutes watched statistics for their stuff. And there you go. You have it on the background. That's minutes watched. Uh, from Christopher Moonlight Productions. Hey, Christopher. Uh, I can tell you why he gets work. Executives want content that is mid enough that won't land in theaters because there's job because their jobs depend on ticket sales. But they're there. But with VOD, failure can't be pinpointed. Uh, failure, yeah. I mean, there's a big expense uh, when it comes to movies. And I think, look, I... Yeah, when you, when you talk distribution and everything, man, like, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's a whole thing, you know? Yeah, I mean, I will say that at CinemaCon, uh, at least from the big studios, particularly Disney, the, the message is clear. Uh, put your movies in theaters. You know, all of them are saying, you know, we the experiment failed... Uh, movie theaters are important. Uh, the only company not embracing that is Netflix. Uh, and I don't, it doesn't. You know why though? Like, I'll tell you why. They don't have to. Yeah. Netflix doesn't have to embrace theater. Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you exactly. Um, I keep mentioning this director, so I'm not going to mention again, but a very popular but hated director. I talked to him. I asked him about, about his film not being in theaters or being in theaters for a weekend. And, uh, you know, he was upset about it, but he, what he told me is Netflix thinks that theaters are going to cannibalize their business. And, and that's why none of this stuff comes to theaters. And it doesn't, it doesn't appear like it's going to change. But also there is a money, a money aspect to releasing in a theater. And, mm -hmm. you know, if Netflix doesn't have to, then why? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, bigger discussion. Uh, ben Johnson for 10. Thank you. Uh, happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. Um, for Oliver Lavery Farag for five pounds. Uh, I know I screwed up your name. Filmmaking is not about what you know. It's not about who you know. It's about what you know about who you know. <laughs> I like that. And it's true. Yeah, very true. Let's see. Just make sure we got timing right. Uh, from Manolo Rivera, uh, I admit that my bias slash love for DC caused me to give Snyder the benefit 
of the doubt, but not so much now. Yeah, look, you like you like Man of Steel. I like Man of Steel. I stand I'm by it. Here. Look, it it wasn't the best you know Superman story I've seen, but I I feel like out the gate it wasn't a bad place to start if they were going to like continue in that universe, yeah, right? But- I I didn't I didn't like Batman versus Superman, but I did like Man of Steel. Yeah, I I did not like Man of Steel. I think a lot of it had to do with it didn't the, the story didn't feel like a Man of Steel story, didn't feel like a Superman story, and and I'm just not on board with this dark DC. No offense, uh, but uh, I you know his tone it just I, I Superman Richard Donner is the tone of Superman, not Zack Snyder. No, I I agree. I'm hoping James Gunn kind of makes. Mm-hmm. I, I want Gunn to make the 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 the. I want him to embrace Donner, but not. I don't want another copy of Donner. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I want, yeah. I I want comic book Superman. That's what I want, and I, I I'm hoping Gunn gives us that. Yeah. Well, the upside is that uh, in all the press releases for Gunn's Superman Legacy, uh, every press release has the phrase uh, "Truth, Justice, and the American Way." Okay. There which we go. Gives you, which gives you a sense that at least he understands the foundations of Superman. Whether he executes it is another thing, but at least. He's including it. All right. From Mob19001, this poster isn't making any sense like the movie. Hey, let's take a look at that again. Uh, yeah, it's just a scene from the movie, essentially, with all the with all the heads in it. All right. Let's go back. Uh, from Patrick Lemire, Snyder Man with great power comes... <laughs> sorry. Snyder Man with great power comes great something. All right. I read that wrong. Samuel Aratan for 1999. Thank you. I'm sick and tired of algorithms attempting to condition us. I don't want their recommendations. That's why I come here. Uh, we had so much more freedom at movie stores. Uh, they were curated collections and drove, drove, and you drove interest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that was surprising because when I asked him, D- does the algorithm work? And he says, yeah, it works. So they're just going to lean into it for good or bad. Uh, from Beaver Gladiator, the hero's journey was killed by the hero's her heroes affirmation. <laughs> and then MK saw Fair it. enough. Yeah. MK saw it for $4.99. Hey guys, I was reading up on the British, uh, of the new Blade movie. It's a mess. Now it will take place in present time. Blade's daughter also has purple hair. Of course she does. Yeah. Well, it's coming from Marvel. I, uh, you know, I. There's just no faith in Marvel that they're going to pull something off, or something good. All right. Hey, we're gonna let's talk about what we came here to talk about. Uh, we're gonna pivot for one moment here, and yeah, you got to keep up. You got to keep up. Yeah, got to keep up. Keep it up. Rock it hard, make it work, and make it so. Nice. Yeah, that's what that's what uh, four years of seminary will do for you. <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk about the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can do justice to this. Uh, to this film. Uh, the film is basically the fictionalized version of Operation Postmaster from World War II. Uh, it, uh, it's basically the origins of special forces, uh, of the Mission Impossible Force, if you will, where a group of ne'er-do-wells will go in and do a job for the sake of uh, Britain, for its, uh, for its future. Uh, and, but if they're caught by either the British or the Germans, uh, the State Department will disavow any knowledge of them. Uh, stars Henry Cavill as Gus March uh, Phillips, Eliza Gonzalez as Marjorie Stewart, Alan Richson, Henry Golding. Uh, the cast goes on and on. Um, the whole idea here is that Britain is on the verge of, uh, of surrender when it comes to the Germans. Uh, the Germans have U-boats that have been sinking uh, supplies coming from America. Uh, the United States refuses to enter the war uh, because it feels that uh, that England is lost. 
Uh, so they need one big victory in order to uh, to assure America's involvement in World War II. So they decide that they're going to cripple the U-boat fleet. Uh, there's fuel, supplies, everything U-boats need in a small port in Africa. And if they can destroy the supply ship, uh, the U-boats will become will be rendered useless and the Americans can enter the war and hopefully defeat Hitler. Um, and so this is uh, basically a movie of that mission to to uh, sink this supply ship. Uh, and it's head, headed by Henry Cavill with a bunch of men who like killing people. Uh, Dante, what did you think of the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare? You know, um, I'm a little mixed on it. I There are parts of it I really dug. Um, I, I got to be honest with you, man. I think... Look, I, Henry Cavill and Alan Richardson definitely carry a certain part of the film for me, for sure. But honestly, I was more intrigued with Aiza Gonzalez, like in her storyline. Like I felt like that was the more uh, intriguing story was her and and uh, the black guy and the <laughs> espionage stuff that they were doing. I can't remember his name for some reason. Yeah, he was, uh, Mr. Heron. He he was in um, in Dune. He's been in a bunch of other movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I can never remember his name. But I, I just felt like their story was the better story. And this, and all the stuff with Henry Cavill and Alan Richardson and all those guys, it was okay, but it it, it didn't draw me enough. You're right. I feel like the film kind of fell apart in the third act for me a little bit. Um, like the buildup was good. And then it, it kind of started weakening as it went on. But I thought the stuff with Aiza was good um, all the way through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it helps to make her sexy. Uh, I just think, like, her and Melissa Barrera, I feel like, in two two Latina actresses, man, uh, I felt like they carried these films. Like, both of these films I saw yesterday were from these two women. And uh, that's that's saying something, man. When you, when you got an all-star cast like uh, on Gentleman Warfare, I mean, like, it, it says a lot. Yeah, you know... You know, it's it, when it comes to this movie, I, you know, I, I kind of like part of me wants to want to watch a World War II, uh, you know, drama and a, a military operation. But at the same time, I think like, you know, I think this is just a Guy Ritchie movie under the guise of a World War II operation. Which um, isn't normally bad, man. I, yeah. I, I, lo I love Guy Ritchie, man. Um, I think he's real. Unfortunately, he's become very hit or miss, you know, for every snatch. You have a King Arthur, right? Yeah. So, uh, well, it's that last one. That last one he did with uh, with Jason Statham and Aubrey Plaza, which is horrible. It, it was. It, it felt like it was uh, Guy Ritchie's attempt to make a Guy Ritchie movie. Um, and he's and become a, a character of, of himself. Yeah, he is. But but the thing, like like Zack Snyder, there there's a definite look and feel to a Guy Ritchie movie, and this this has that feel to it all. And I think. I think it's supported by a much better story than you see uh, from a Guy Ritchie movie. But this is still definitely a Guy Ritchie movie where the heroes have this swagger. This, yeah. Uh, you know, this cool swagger as they're murdering people. You know, five people uh, up against 200 people and none of the five dies. You know, that's that's the Guy Ritchie swagger to this all. Uh, you know, how 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 is uh, Henry Cavill and uh, Alan Richardson uh, going to go through and murder all these people and look good doing it? And, and and I love the fact that that Alan Richardson was a psychopath. Man. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I know he's gotten into some heat lately because of some things he said about you know cops or you know politics, whatever. But Alan Richardson was really good in this movie. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, okay, and again, this is a Guy Ritchie movie, which means there's there's going to be race and gender swaps, uh, mostly race swaps in this. Henry Goulding as uh, Henry Goulding plays Freddie Alvarez. Uh, not sure how you make that connection, but uh, look, there you go. There's the casting. Um, Isa Gonzalez plays Marjorie Stewart, who is uh, par uh, part Jew. Um, right, know, right. You know, that's, you know, she looked good. And so that's, you know, that's where that's where you just have to sit there and go, look, this is not a World War II, a reenactment of a World War II operation. Right. Uh, it's it's a Guy Ritchie movie. And, 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 let's be, and let's be fair about the race swap with her, though, because, like, she has the the caliber to pull off that role, though. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I I've I, I loved her in Baby Driver. I loved her uh, in uh, Three Body Problem. I I think 
she has a huge future um, in this business. But uh, she had something on screen, man, that made me want to just keep watching. Yeah. Like, yeah, she kept me in that movie. Yeah. And even though through most of the movie she's covered up, uh, at the end, uh, she's Cleopatra and looks amazing. Uh, <laughs> There we go. We're sexualizing women already. No, no, no. I, I'm not even talking about just her looks. I mean, like, her performance, man, was, like, top-notch. Well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like what uh, what Black Widow is. You know, she's using her her uh, feminine wiles, her intelligence, uh, to get information, to to manipulate the uh, the antagonist, the, the evil, uh, what's his name? Uh, why can't I find the name here? The evil Nazi. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's the thing. You, you mentioned it before, but there are two parallel stories going on here. There's the brute force of Henry Cavill and Alan Richardson and his team uh, with the guns, the knives, the explosives. And then you kind of have the mani manipulative diplomacy going on with Isa Gonzalez um, to kind of... Uh, you know, to to kind of get into the mind of the Nazi, the bad Nazi, and I wish I knew his I think, name. Uh, Till Schweiger is his name. Uh, oh, yeah. he in, uh, in, Heinrich he in, uh, Yeah, he was in Inglorious Bastards too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so and and of course, again, um, you can you can kill hundreds of Nazis without feeling guilty uh, from an audience standpoint. So this is the perfect story to <laughs> for mass murder. Yeah, you can pop story. them up with axes and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly cut their uh, hearts I mean, out and you know yeah i mean for me uh it's a guy ritchie movie I, I think it's a really good guy ritchie movie and, and i would recommend it on, on those grounds i also you know, i also like the nod that he that he put like ian fleming in in the, in the film mm -hmm. like oh, i was yeah. like okay that, that that's pretty smart yeah and to kind of i i think i, I appreciate I, I i'm looking up the original uh was it operation postmaster I'm looking up what it actually was, and okay, uh, you know, we're we're here for the fun. We're not here for history, for history. And then, nah. and then the the only sticking point is at the end where they kind of go through the, uh, you know, what happened to each of the characters in real life. Yeah, and uh, and they're throwing out all these letters and acronyms and stuff, and I'm I have no idea what they're talking about. I'm sure they all did well uh, going out of it. So you know what? I, and, and I was I, I I the thing I didn't like about that at the end was. I wish they would have just put their character next to the real life person so that we knew who they were talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm like, wait, wait, which character was that? Which character was that? Like, I, I wasn't sure who the character was, you know, compared to their real life counterpart. So. Yeah. And my point is it's a Guy Ritchie movie and it doesn't matter. I agree. No, I, I totally agree. And look, there's certain things you expect from a Guy Ritchie film, mm -hmm. man. Uh, the thing you expect most of all is cool. Yeah. Right, you look at Snatch. That's just a movie about cool people <laughs> doing cool yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, and this, you know, and this also leans into that that British stereotype of everyone's so sophisticated, even if they're scoundrels. Yeah, they're sophisticated, and and so nothing phases them. You know, they'll walk by an exploding building, and nothing, you know, not even not even flinch. And, and I, I love like the little quirks, like like Henry Cavill's character and his thing with coats. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and taking coats from his enemies, you know, like, like that whole thing. Um, yeah. There, there were look, there were things I really loved about this movie. Um, like I said, the third eye gets a little weaker, but uh, it's still fun. It's still a Guy Ritchie movie, um, so you'll you'll definitely enjoy parts of it for sure, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, I, no, I, I think I liked the third act a lot better than you did. It, it's uh, it's it was the action that I wish was kind of going through the whole thing. You know, it starts off with some action. Uh, then there's this great span of uh, of diplomacy that occurs in the middle. It's like Monkey Man. Um, you know, the middle of the movie kind of is about setting the, the chess pieces up. And then you get to that third act, which, of course, uh, things don't go according to plan. And kinda of course not. How can get out of it. All right. <laughs> so uh, final final verdict uh, is Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare uh, recommend. Yes, I would definitely recommend it. It's it's a fun movie, man. Go with a group of people. Um, you're definitely going to laugh. Um, it, the story is there. The story is there. And uh, just remember, you're going into a Guy Ritchie movie, okay? So, like, there's certain expectations you should walk in with. <laughs> and, uh, you know, nothing should really surprise you with this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, definitely a lot of fun. It's, it's a Guy Ritchie movie. That's what you're getting into. Don't 
don't think you're going to get anything other than that. Yeah, this isn't a history film. This isn't like, you know, based, well, <laughs> very loosely based on a true story. Yeah. It also comes from Lionsgate, so I'm kind of impressed by what they got for the budget. Uh, I can't imagine this this film costing more than like $75 million uh, to a hundred. And, and they did a great job, uh, you know, making that, making this movie look like a big blockbuster film. Right. Uh, I mean, cause they're the biggest star in the film is Cavill and um, they probably didn't get him for that much. So, which, which is a shame to me. Cause yeah. I, I think that guy should be like the highest paid actor in Hollywood, but, um, yeah. but they didn't, they, they, they probably didn't get him for that much. Yeah, and they, look, it, again, it's Lionsgate. And, and Lionsgate is good about knowing the potential of their movies, about how, how much it's going to make. I mean, John John Wick 4, as great as it was, only made $100 million. And mm. uh, I'm sure they knew that going in, and they budgeted accordingly. And and I have to believe they did it with this movie as well. Uh, you know, again, I, I you know, it's not going to be the big studios that are going to make money this year. It's going to be those mid-range studios like Lionsgate and A24. A yeah, A24 for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they they definitely have a a good grasp of uh, of making movies and and making money making movies. And they know how to budget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They know how to budget yeah. their films. Yeah, I mean, let's remember, uh, H uh, Lionsgate made Plane. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's... They, they can't. They can't all be winners. Yeah. Well, it, you know, they knew what they were getting into with playing, and and I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the uh, budget reflected that. Uh, let's get to your comments, Thomas Pickett. Uh, this looks good, but I'm really tired of World War II movies. You know, what's interesting. Um, the more World War II movies that come out today, uh, they always tell stories of uh, the mission that changed the direction of the war. And I'm like, how many movies about World War II, about changing the direction of the war, can can there be? Um, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but there's a movie about Marcel Marceau the Mime, who was a <laughs> French resistance leader who changed the direction of the war. And it had nothing to do with mime. Um, you know, the imitation game, uh, cracking the, the Nazis' computer code, uh, changed the direction of, of the war. So... This is another one that changed the direction of the war. Uh, from Brock Samsonite. I heard this movie is basically a lesser and glorious bastards with Henry Cavill. Um, I mean, I would define Inglorious Bastards as uh basically a movie about it's it's the Jewish end of things in terms yeah. of uh, in terms of the war. Uh this, you know, I think Mar Marjorie Stewart is the only Jew in the movie. Um and I found it interesting that she sang Mac the Knife because uh, was that Irving Berlin? Mac the Knife. Um, i trying to see who wrote it. Um, was it Bobby Darren who wrote it? Can that be? Uh, yeah, no, you got Mark Blitzstein, Kurt Vall, uh, Eugene Brett. Yeah, so, um, you know, all I know is uh, Nazis didn't like Jewish composers. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> All right, Samuel Aritan. Uh, hey man, so long as oh, as long as Gary is doing English gangster or war stuff, I'm in. Oh, since Guy is doing English gangster or war stuff, I'm in. Uh, LOL, snatch, lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. The gentleman, hell yeah, King Arthur. No, I don't think I've seen King Arthur. It's pretty bad. Okay, <laughs> I'll have to see it then. Uh, Joseph, ungentlemanly warfare has a 93 audience. Uh, ninety-three percent audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. I will tell you this: uh, my theater was uh, was I'd say fifty percent full, and uh, it was mostly uh, military guys who were watching the movie with me. Uh, from Rumble, ADLS twenty-four. Dante is the first reviewer who said that. Who has said that? All other reviews call Isa's plot uh, the most boring. The They're smoking boring. crack. I know. Is it boring? I mean. Look, uh, her story is is one of talk. It's one of uh, using uh, using one's personality, so to speak, to get what you need. Uh, she she really doesn't pull out a gun until the end of the movie. So she had she literally had the most tense uh, scenes in the film. Yeah, especially at the end. Yeah, like like you felt like she was literally just. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to ruin it, but it's it's no no no. They're crazy. Okay. They're wrong. I'm right. <laughs> uh, for from Willie the Monkey King's music uh, member for three months. Hey Willie, uh, what's up, Alan? Big D Ing and Dante. 
how is marketing <laughs> for movies uh, any uh, different from marketing anything else? Thank you for any recommendations. Yeah, oh, we could get into marketing. Yeah, that's a whole video, man. <laughs> and part of it is, uh, you know, if you're a filmmaker, it's clear that filmmakers aren't always involved in the marketing of their movies. Uh, you know, in terms of the trailers, uh, I've seen, I've literally seen movies ruined by trailers, uh, the ending spoiled. Um, you know, and then, uh, then there are those who do get that kind of control. And, um, it, but the thing is, uh, let's see. So I, you have any comments on this? I have something that I just want to think about for a second. Look, uh, a movie is a product like any other product, right? And it's all about knowing who your, your target audience is. That, that th there's really no difference between marketing a Snickers and marketing a movie other than knowing who your target is, right? So that's who you need to please. And the way you do that with film is through your trailers, man. Your trailers have to tell a compelling, at least enough of a story to get interest, right? And, and after that, it's just getting it seen. But you have to know who you're targeting and your movie has to know its audience. So if you if you don't know who that is, then you're gonna have a hard time marketing your film. Yeah, you know, with Disney, uh, like let's keep trolling Disney. Um, but marketing used to be, as you say, who your audience is, and then pandering to that audience. Uh, now it's marketing seems to be what you want your audience to be. You know, it's clear that you know if you the more you continue to gender swap, race swap. Uh, you know, ch play around with sexual orientation, you realize that you, you've lost grasp of who your audience is because you think that's what we're looking for. You think we want to see people who look like us when the reality is, is we just want a good story that we can relate to. Um, we got a few more comments and then we have a special guest, Matt Page, who is the writer director of Cop vs. Killer, uh, an indie film. Uh, and the reason I really want to talk to him is, uh, you know, it's a low budget thriller. And, uh, and I want to talk about, you know, how you get one of those made, you know, how do you, you know, the challenges you face. So we're going to talk with Matt in just a few minutes here. Um, from Tom Flynn, uh, you can't kill Nazis now if you're Disney. Uh, in Indiana Jones, in the last Indiana Jones movie, they saved Hitler. Well, you can't play around with history. I mean, there, there are repercussions to that. Um, and then Red Pilled Rants, Hitler is the most played out villain ever. Yeah, it's still effective though. Still Hitler effective. is a lazy villain for, mm -hmm. for, for, for movies. Yeah. Remember, it used to be Russians. Yes. In the uh, 80s, it was all the Russians. Yeah, you can't do Russians. Well, I guess, I don't know. Maybe we can get back to Russia. <laughs> Dude, I, I missed the Cold War, man. Yeah. We, we, we got some good stuff out of that. <laughs> I don't know. Someone said we're kind of living in a cold culture war right now. Uh, that the I cold can see war that. Yeah, the, the war is being fought behind the scenes on social media. Uh, from Samuel Ayrton for nine ninety nine. Thank you. Uh, with BlackRock buying into games workshops and Amazon buying rights to Warhammer, is Cavill going to be able to hold back the chaos? Uh, long live the Emperor of the Nerds. I don't know. What's your thoughts on Cavill? That's a good question, man. Um, before before this week. Or last week, I would have said yes, but I, from what I'm hearing, Warhammer is going in a really weird direction as far as the game goes. How, if that's going to affect the movie or the TV show he wants to do, I don't know. But I know the fans of Warhammer right now are not happy, so because it's going in this weird woke DEI direction that the game never went in before. I don't know how that affects the movie itself, though. Yeah, I mean, it seems like. Uh, <laughs> From from what we've heard from Henry Cavill is he seems to have a a good head on his shoulders. He's a bit based, and he likes he likes he uh, he appreciates the fans. I think I know Hollywood for a fact though does not like Cavill because he's not one of them. Mm -hmm. So yes, this could affect his movie. Yeah, which again is why Hollywood's no longer the dream. They will take away your soul. They will suck the life out of you, uh, and they will make you you know. If you're hired as a director or writer, you're really not the director or writer. If you don't play ball, then you might as well just not have a career. All right. In Hollywood. All right. Let's pivot. We have a special guest with us uh, this morning. Uh, let me get uh, let me get us moved over. Uh, here we go. All right. Something else here. 
Let's go. Yes. Okay. If Here I we... knew where we were going, I would uh, transition you there. No, I'm. We're going. But I'm. Have you seen the list? The I see this, list? but you don't go in order. That's the problem. Oh man, <laughs> why do I, I? I need to get rid of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I come out the winner in that one, but I need to get rid of that one. Uh, hey, uh, we have a special guest uh, joining us, a maker. Let me get this right. Uh, whoops, no, we're gonna do this. We have Matt Page with us, the writer, the director, the star of Cop versus Killer. Uh, hi, Matt. How you doing? Good, good. How are you? Good. I'm I'm Alan. This is uh, Dante helping me. Nice out. to meet you, Matt. Nice to meet you. I, I watch uh, I watch Film Threat. I watch your YouTube channel channel pretty regularly. Big fan, so I'm excited to be here. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah. I I had actually reviewed your film, uh, Cop vs. Killer. Um, give us the. Quick I appreciate run. the review. Thank you. That was. Oh uh, no problem. Uh, yeah, give us a quick rundown on Cop vs. Killer. So the basic premise is uh, uh, it is uh, about a small town sheriff who is. Uh, attacked and left for dead by a killer, and then the killer takes um, the sheriff's car, his badge, and his gun, and begins terrorizing the town that the sheriff is supposed to protect. So it becomes a kind of cat and mouse game uh, of my character. I, I play the, the the sheriff in the movie, uh, trying to catch the killer while also being mistaken for the killer, because the news media just reports that hey, the sheriff is killing people. So as I'm trying to catch the killer, I also keep getting mistaken for the killer. So uh, uh, it's, an, it's a, something that I, I, I wrote a long time ago that I was finally able to, to, to make into a reality. Absolutely. Okay, so we've got uh, over 500 people watching the chat. If you have any questions for Matt, uh, post them in the chat. Uh, Matt will answer those. But uh, one of the things that, that uh, you know, I, I watch a lot of indie films and one genre that is slowly being uh, taken over by indie films is kind of the action thriller and, and yours falls into that. Um, what, you know, what was the impetus for making the film? And uh, you know, what were your thoughts in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume you didn't have a lot of money to make the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, were, what were a lot of the considerations you made knowing your budget, but wanting also to make a, an effective thriller? Yeah, it was. Uh, it's a miracle. Now, I have so much. I've known for a long time how hard it is to make a movie. I've known people who have made movies. I've worked. I've acted in movies. But I have so much respect for anybody that completes an independent feature film because it is a miracle that any of them get finished because it was so challenging that um, each day when I went, we only shot, we shot the whole thing in 10 days. And the schedule was so tight that we couldn't afford to lose a day. If we lost a day, we were not going to be able to film the movie. So so if at the end of every day, I would go back to the hotel room and I'd be there by myself alone in the hotel and I would just say to myself, nine more days, <laughs> eight more days, seven more days. Because I was like, there's no way. I don't know how we're going to pull this off. So we did pull it off. As far as the action thriller, um, I really, I'm a big fan of, um, the horror genre, the thriller genre, but also the action genre. And I love it when they come together. Um, it's such a unique kind of genre. And I grew up on movies like, I don't know, like, like death warrant mm -hmm. with Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know, like these weird movies that kind of like they had a martial arts star, but it's kind of a thriller, but it can't be too much of a horror because he's not really a horror guy. So like, I, I, I really like the blending of those genres of like finding a way to get, a lot of action, but with like horror elements in the same movie. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and one thing about, I think one of the reasons why it's difficult for indie filmmakers to make thrillers is a uh, insurance and B safety. Um, oh yeah. 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 When we talked to the insurance company, uh, you know, we started talking about some of the action and stuff and they were like, you can't afford it. Don't even ask. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we, you know, that we got them to agree to let us have like, you know, we were able to have like rubber guns on set and like a couple of airsoft pistols. Um, the, the stunts, you know, luckily um, the gentleman who plays the killer, Kevin Conan Bankins uh, is a mm -hmm. martial artist and a, a martial artist I've been training with for 15 years. So when it came time to do the fights, he and I knew each other, we knew how to train how to choreograph. Um, but, you know, as it happens with independent films, you know, the day we, each location, part of the design of the movie, 
the only reason we could get away with it was the structure of the film, if you see it, is that my character goes to a location and meets uh, one of the characters from the film. And then later in the film, the killer goes back to the same location and and wreaks havoc. Exactly. And so from a production standpoint, I was like, oh, well, cool. So we'll shoot my ha my scene in the morning and then we'll shoot the killer scene in the second half of the day. And that way that location is wrapped each day mm -hmm. and we get a lot of longevity out of it. When we did that with the, there's a, there's a diner location we were so behind schedule that by the time we got to the fight, we had like an hour to shoot the whole fight. And it was the pivotal fight between the, the my character and the killer. And people were telling me like, oh, you're, you're going to have to cut it. You're going to have to cut the fight. You don't have, have enough time. And I was like, oh, we can't cut the fight. So I went to the, the camera team who were exhausted. They were fantastic. Seth Fuller was our DP. And I said, here's the thing. Okay. Pick an angle. We're going to do the whole fight don't cut then just change the angle just a little bit and then we're going to do the whole fight and then just change the angle a little bit we did the fight like six times in a row and we just had them change the angle just a little bit each time and i was like whatever you get i'll edit it i'll figure it out we'll we'll, we'll cut it into a fight and that's how we end up getting the fight of the movie <laughs> yeah yeah it's amazing what how creative you can get when you're pushed pushed uh against the wall but yeah, see, you, I was you put out the best cool. work when you do that, though, man. It's I, like absolutely. That was what it gave me some of the most. Like, it gave me so much confidence when I in the editing room. I had a great editor, Daniel Dinning, and and when some of the scenes came together, I was remembering what a disaster the shooting day was and how many things fell apart. And yet, when the footage started to work, particularly on things we did on instinct, because we had no choice. And some of some of them came together. You know, it's a flawed movie. There are some things I wish were better than others, but there are some scenes that came together so well. And I thought, wow, it, how did we get away with that? I can't believe we got away <laughs> with, with that working. You know. All right. So, so let me ask you a question for the uh, budding filmmaker. Uh, what were the challenges you faced uh, before before green lighting basically the project, saying, okay, we're we're doing this? You know, it was uh, it was really that the only reason the movie happened is because somebody came to us and said that like they they felt like they had a, you know a little bit of money a very little bit of money and actually uh one of the conditions was that lou ferrigno was going to play the killer um and they had a connection to him i had a meeting with lou he was very excited about the film and then he had to drop out because he got offered a movie that could actually pay him real money <laughs> um, and so but we kept going along. We kind of just kept going along as if the movie was going to happen. And that was something I'd never done before. I was told that we had some money like New Year's Eve in 2021. So like December 31st, 2021, we were filming February 28th. Mm -hmm. So in like just a few weeks, like just deciding that the movie was going to happen, it kind of happened. And so the challenge was, knowing that we absolutely couldn't fit the movie that I wrote into the budget that we had. So continuing to pare it down and pare it down. I gave the script to a producer friend of mine and said, what, you know, just give me your, give me your impression about like whether or not we can do this. Cause we were going to have to have SAG actors. I'm a SAG actor. Mm -hmm. And she called me an hour and a half later after she read it. And she said, are you out of your mind? I said, what? She said, do you know how many speaking roles you have in this film? And I said, 25 she said 52 <laughs> she, said, she said you have characters who walk in say one thing and are never seen again she's like you need to cut all of those <laughs> and so like our movie had an entire sheriff's department with like five deputies <laughs> oh, it suddenly became one deputy well one deputy got all of the dialogue because we couldn't afford to have people uh, in the movie. So it, uh, my, my daughter, the, the woman who plays my, the young lady who plays my daughter in the movie, initially she was eight years old. And then somebody was like, you know, if you have a kid on set, you have to have like a teacher and you can only work them a certain number of hours and everything. So immediately my daughter went from eight to 18. It was like, okay, problem solved. She's, she's a young adult problem solved. So we just kept having to figure out how to fit the movie that we could afford to shoot uh into the the script that i wrote so every day we would show up on set and i would read what i wrote and go okay so we can't do most of that what can we do 
Uh, what's the version of the movie that I wrote that we can shoot? And so it was just adapting the movie every single day, fitting it into what we had time for. All right. Well, we got some uh, some questions from the chat. Uh, before we do, is that a million subscriber plaque behind you? The other side, yes. This side. <laughs> what's uh, your channel? How did you get the? Uh, so the, my my channel is called Enter the Dojo Show. I play a character known as Master Ken. Um, I wear a red uniform and a mustache, and uh, it's uh, something that I've been doing for uh, for over ten years now. Um, it was actually it, it was going to be my way into trying to make make films. I I I, I got an idea to make a little a web series back when people were calling them web series, you know. Um, and uh, we made a little satirical martial arts show, and it kind of took off and became my job. So for the past ten years, longer than ten years, uh, that's been my job. Wow! Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. We just re we just got this wrong wrong side. I we we just got this like two months ago. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> yeah, me too. I just got my th my hundred thousand. Oh, uh, awesome! <laughs> I, yeah, I've got my I, mine is so old, like you wouldn't recognize it. I like we my hundred thousand is like they don't. It doesn't look at all like they look now. It's like in a little cheap box. It's like a little round button it's it's yeah. still i still love it but yeah. <laughs> well congratulations and yes chat we're better than you all right uh, <laughs> uh there we go i just got us fired uh, I'm, I'm with you right. chat i i don't have a plaque in the back of my uh on my walls or anything so you'll get there if, if you'll get, you get there if you want one you'll get there it's totally I'm, I'm with the people <laughs> <laughs> all right question from the nerd far away hail mr page uh how can i work toward getting involved in film while living in an area without a large or even independent studio i'm currently at a local news station in that's a re that's a really good question i mean what when people ask me about that you know like one of the great things about the digital revolution you know it's been called is like equipment is cheaper than it's ever been it's higher quality than it's ever been it's accessible um it's it feels like there's movies being made everywhere what, what what i would say is to like if you put yourself out there as willing to work for free or close to free people will find you like uh but because if there's one thing independent movies need they need free help or close to free help because it's so hard to make a movie especially if we we had several people who just offered to kind of just come and hang out and help us because they knew we were broken they knew we needed help and and we are grateful to every single one of them uh so what i would say is like look for people you know go to film like look for film schools look for ads online find people who are making movies and mm -hmm. just offer to be on set offer to carry uh offer to go get lunch, offer to carry uh, equipment, offer to just whatever they need just to be there and to be around them. Because the more of those people you're around, if you have a good experience and they have a good experience with you, they will bring you along on future productions. All right. Great. Good advice. Uh, Solomon Thornton, greetings sir Matt. Any advice for beginning filmmakers? Yeah. Don't wait. Don't wait. I, I sat on the script for 10 years. I'm grateful. I, I, I couldn't have made the version of the movie that we made without the help of the people who brought money to it. Uh, uh, most notably triangle U studios down in truth or consequences. Got to give them a shout out. And my wonderful girlfriend who did the producing on the film, uh, and said, it'll be fun. And I was like, honey, it's not going to be, she had never produced a movie before. And I was like, it's not going to be fun. It's going to be really fulfilling and satisfying, but it's not going to be fun. Um, I would say that I could have, I set out to make this movie. In fact, the original draft was as a found footage, like a Blair Witch kind of thing. And I wrote it like that because I was like, oh, well, that way, if it looks like shit, like it'll be part of the, it'll be part of the aesthetic of the film. It's, it's fine. And I should, I could have made a version of that film 10 years ago. And I'm incredibly proud of the version that we did. I'm so glad we made it. I wish I was on my third or fourth or fifth movie by now because just completing the movie is the point go out like pick something you can make go make it and then make another one like that's the that that's the way you have to do that all right uh mark gregory gacosta hi what's your inspiration for the movie the premise sounds good honestly at the time i was watching uh a lot of youtube i was trying to figure out youtube the, you know this was i think i wrote this uh, wrote the script after I'd created um, Enter the Dojo Show and Master Ken. And what I was fascinated with at the time was badge cam 
videos and dash cam videos of actual, you know, crazy things happening at traffic stops and things like that. And I had the thought at one point, I was like, you know, what's wild is that when I get pulled over, when I've been pulled over, I just assume that this person is who they say they are. So that if somebody could pose as a police officer and be this psycho and I wouldn't know until it was too late. Now, like, I don't know why I got that thought in my head, but I thought, well, that would be a scary premise if some dude just decided to pose as a cop and go around just terrorizing people. I thought, well, that's, you know, that's an interesting, and, you know, there have been a few movies like that, but I thought, well, what about a found footage approach to that? And so that was sort of the, the impetus of the original idea. And then when it came time to make the movie more recently, um, I reread the script after not having read it for a few years. And the first thing I threw out was a lot of the found footage stuff. Cause I thought, well, I, I need to, I, I need to like, kind of throw that away. That's going to be too hard to do. Let's just shoot it like a movie. And, you know, I feel like it was going to be too challenging to make that believable. All right. Uh, we have a super chat from Bush and Ryu cat for $2, Matt. That's an awesome tea you got. Can you name them? I knew, I knew as soon as I put, I even tried to name them, by myself before I put this on, I should have looked it up. Okay, so I know that I know, like Skeletor, Shredder, Cobra Commander. I know this guy <laughs> is from Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. Uh, this is the bad guy from Thundercats, and the bad guy from Transformers, whose name is begins uh, with a D. Oh, why can't I? There's remember. Megatron and. Decepti no, those are Decepticons. Decepticons, like the head of the Decepticons is Devastator. Right? <laughs> it's, close <laughs> no, it is. it's close to that. It, it starts with a D. I, I, as soon as I put this on, I was like, somebody's gonna ask we'll me. Just call him the big D. All right. The big D. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm stumped. <laughs> uh, Black Star uh, 1069. Uh, how hard is it to do action choreography in indie films? Yeah, you know, we were, uh, like I said, I was really lucky that I, I've been training as a martial artist since I was uh, 16 years old. And I purposely, um, when I knew that Lou wasn't going to be able to do the movie, I knew who my next call was because I had kind of in the back of my mind thought that it, I might even have my buddy uh, Kevin be a body double or something because I didn't know if we were going to be able to 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 have time for Lou to do some of the action. And because we were both trained martial artists who knew each other, we were able to put quite a bit of that together very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if we had not known each other, I think it would have been a lot harder. Um, so that that is one thing that I would say we we were lucky that we knew each other. Um, and 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 again, a lot of the action got pared down. The fight that we shot was maybe half of what we had choreographed. We had to throw a lot of it out because we didn't have time. Um, in that, there were several um, shootouts in the movie gun battles that were supposed to be like a, a whole SWAT team and like two other characters. And like, we would show up and I'd be like, okay, well, we have three guns and three actors. So that's the new version of the shootout. I just have like, keep paring it down and paring it down and fitting it into what we could uh, get away with. Yeah. Also, it would have been cool to have Lou Ferrigno as your doppelganger. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, it, it's bizarre cause he's like seven feet tall, but like, it, 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 it cool. It, and I gotta give Lou credit. I will say initially the, the, the version of the killer that was in the script that, that we had when Lou read it, the killer had almost no lines and Lou uh, gave me some notes and said, you know, I had some ideas about like, I mean, I feel like the killer could be, could have more of a backstory and be more interesting. And he gave me great notes and I did a rewrite based on the thing, the conversation Lou and I had, and then he had to drop out, but Kevin uh, took it over and did a great job with the the notes that Lou gave us. So I got to, I, I always, every time I do talk about the movie, I got to give Lou a shout out for uh, giving me some great feedback on the script that I feel improved the film and a shout out to Kevin for, for giving a great performance as the killer. All right. Uh, where did you film Cop vs. Killer? We filmed in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Okay, good. Then this question applies. Uh, from A.D. Ellis, how has the indie scene in New Mexico been for filmmakers like yourself? Has it been growing since the Breaking Bad production wrapped up? Absolutely. Like, I graduated from film school uh, in 2005, and I was going to move to L.A., but um, then I got hired to do some promotional videos, and then I got I got a, a one line on um, In the Valley of Elah, the Paul Haggis 
movie. Um, who, the guy who directed Crash, and and that got me into SAG. And then I got a very small role. I, I'm in season one of Breaking Bad, just for a, just for a moment. Uh, uh, there's an episode where a security guard is locked in a porta potty. So mm-hmm. if anybody remembers that episode in season one, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a great one of the great things about Netflix. Um, uh, purchasing what was formerly ABQ Studios, now it's a Netflix studio, is that a lot of people can work and make a living on the bigger shows here. And then also, you know, when they have downtime and they have friends who are making films, they can be the crew on independent films. So Albuquerque continues to be a pretty great place to to work in independent film. Oh, that's amazing. All right. Uh, we have a lot of questions, but we can't get to them. But we can get to the important one uh, from Caveat Ties, a supporter. Uh, where can we see the movie? All right. Yeah, that is the most important question. You can see the movie on Amazon. You can see the movie on Tubi. Uh, it's on YouTube rentals. It's on Google Play. Um, so, yeah, just look it up. Uh, if you watch the movie, leave a review, uh, leave a leave a comment uh, that helps us, even if it's not, you know, if you can you can give an honest review. It's OK. I know that it's not a perfect film. We tried really hard. There are some things I really like about the movie. There are some things that I would do differently. But um, yeah, anybody watching, if you're able to watch the movie, to leave us a review, to tell other people about the movie, um, I, I, I aspire to make more movies. And so the more this one gets out there, the better chance I have of doing that. Well, that's awesome. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, congratulations on the movie. Again, you got it made. That's that's the big thing. That is and, the uh, hardest thing. That is the hardest yeah. part, man. Yeah. And uh, and it's available even on Tubi. I think that's where I saw it. So it's it's for free. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot and have a great day. Thanks for having me. See you, Matt. All right. Okay, there we go. Hey, I like talking to indie filmmakers. Uh, it's Again, it's that challenge. Uh, but see, that's the, that's the fun of it, right? though, man. It's the not knowing how you're going to get it done, but you <laughs> get it done somehow, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and to have that kind of restriction, a 10 day restriction to get it done, um, you've got to think on your feet. And, uh, you know, I, I'll say, uh, you know, there's something to be said about filmmakers who are uh, who are struggling to get a movie done versus has everything to get a movie done. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're seeing it play out right now. Mm-hmm. You know, like there, there, there's something so, so so much more exciting about independent filmmakers right now versus a studio because studios mm-hmm. are lazy. That they're relying on formula. They're relying on dumbass DEI advice, where indie filmmakers are just shooting from the hip, and and they're going for it. Right? I, I'd I'd much rather support that and watch that. Okay. Well, hey, what a great show. Um, Brontosaurus Rex, oh, Beerosaurus Rex, uh, twenty member for twenty months. I remember you always in the chats over those twenty months. Uh, I miss the Cold War, uh, Dante James. Yeah. We all miss the Cold War. You know, that looming threat of nuclear apocalypse. Uh, where did that go? Why but you know what, through? though? But but I will say, yeah, you had that threat. But there was a unity to America, right? Mm-hmm. It was us versus the Reds, man. Yeah. Like, 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 I don't know. There was just something about that time, right? Sure, it was scary as hell. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Because the bombs could have easily have dropped during that time. But... You know, looking back, you know, it, it was a pretty unifying time. Yeah. We, I mean, we could disagree on things. And, yes. Uh, and it not cost our jobs. Yeah. Or, or, <laughs> yeah. Okay. With that, uh, hey, want to thank everyone for being here. want to <laughs> thank our mods, Lord Thoth, Atomic Lori, Latino Slam. Of course, there's Ms. P. Coffee, who is, uh, who is uh, wrapping up her tenure here with uh, Film Threat uh, next week. So, uh, uh, yeah, I know. to see her go, man. I know. But uh, again, Film Threat's loss is only fans gain. And, uh, <laughs> Wait, and what? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, Glenn Nuccio, who's been producing the show for, for us as well, uh, giving us these great clips and uh, helping us out desperately behind the scenes. So thank you, Glenn Nuccio. And uh, with that, uh, Dante, tell us where we can find you. Here, I should take this comment off. There we go. There you go. Guys, you can find me at Verbal Riot on YouTube. You can also follow me there on Rumble and Verbal Riot Show on X. Yes. And uh, oh, and also you can see me on Versus every now and then uh, every Monday. Yeah, not Monday. Uh, but, uh, was, <laughs> not oh, yeah, Monday. I, I'm Alan, my pal Al, filmthreat.com, film threat on everything. Uh, with Chris, we're going day to day. The 
the hopes is he'll be back real soon. Uh, most likely not next week, but uh, again, we'll go day to day and see where we're at. Uh, but he is improving and progressing greatly. Uh, join us Monday for verses. Again, we'll have the That Park Place crew who has uh, been embroiled in a little little scuffle with the black gaming girls, black girl gamers. Is that the one? Black girl um, gamers, yeah. Yeah. They're going to be joining us Monday for our versus uh, the erasure of Walt Disney from the Walt Disney Company. Uh, next, And then uh, Hollywood on the Rocks and Film Threat Live next week as well. I promise at some point we will have a white co-host. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know when, but let's just say it is inevitable, just like Iron Man. Uh, so, so with that, uh, we'll see you next time, and let's get out of here. 